everybody. Uh, the topic of my paper is on the relationship between philosophy and religion in India, and um, it is on overcoming Eurocentric stereotypes. The only way to, to be short is to read. Uh, that is why I would like to uh, excuse them, to, 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 to ask for your uh, understanding uh, the uh, perhaps uh, uh, very fast speed of my uh, reading, but uh, I don't see any other way to, you know, to keep to timing, so I will do my best. Uh, Western philosophers often believe that other civilizations in which such phenomena as democracy, science, freedom of thought, and its separation from religion were not developed, couldn't give rise to their own philosophical traditions. This approach to non-Western cultures and civilizations is usually known as Europocentrism or Eurocentrism. But since the publication of Edward Said's famous book, it is also called Orientalism, it has become quite clear that such an approach give gives evidence, first of all, of a specific frame of Western mind. According to the famous philosopher and endologist Wilhelm Halpers, uh, this is not just an expression of doubt concerning the factual occurrence of the phenomenal philosophy in the Orient, but also a self-demarcation, self-representation, and self-assertion of Europe in the name of a particular concept of philosophy. To make the point uh, the other way around, the image of the other is based on our own self-image. And let us notice and let us confess that uh, very often all the distinctive features that we ourselves attribute uh, to the other contribute to our own self-assertion and our own superiority feeling. Uh, in this paper, I will focus uh, my attention on one important feature of the Western self-image of philosophy, which is its uh, separation from religion. This secure philosopher, philosophy is often estimated as one of the greatest achievements of Western civilization as compared with the backwardness of other traditions. Uh, and among them, of uh, inter-philosophical tradition, in which philosophy is supposed to be tightly intervened with religion. Uh, it is true that in India, Logos did not attempt to break away from myth, or to break away from right, uh, even less from any religious tradition. Uh, to the question I'm going to deal uh, with here is as follows. Does this connection with religion prevent Indian philosophy to be philosophy as a, a rational enterprise? First of all, let us define in what sense we will use the word religion. In the West, the truths of philosophy and those of religion were respectively linked to the realms of reason and of faith. Faith somehow filled the gap between, on the one hand, uh, revealed truths, and on the other hand, with those truths which were based on empirical observation and rational thought. For instance, experience shows that a course decays uh, after the death. Various religion teaches the resurrection of flesh. In India, the truth of revelation does <coughs> not deal with the facts of daily experience and, in a more general way, do not interfere with our empirical knowledge of the world. Shankara says that revelation shruti does not teach that fire is cold and wet. Most Indian schools of philosophy are based on the principle that the empirical world is ruled by human action, the law of karma, which imprints traces, uh, giving rise to a similar activity in the future. All souls being continuously affected by these traces 
are reborn in different body envelopes. Those continuous rebirths, named samsara, indicate that any form of empirical existence is essentially incomplete and imperfect. That is why philosophical schools declare their aim to be emancipation from samsara and attainment of the ultimate reality beyond realities and compositions. To be sure, for these schools, the ultimate reality could not be attained through conceptual reflection. Uh, does that mean that it was a mere object of faith? Not at all. Be being beyond the scope of rational understanding, the ultimate reality still remained accessible to experience. That is, to meditation and intuition or revelation. Even in the major Indian religions like Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism, faith is not regarded as the only way to deal with domains beyond rational elucidation. Faith plays its important role only in the devotional movements, bhakti movements of Hinduism, uh, but in traditions that give primacy to the path of knowledge, jnana, or the path of action, faith, shraddha, is rather a preliminary condition than a true vehicle to emancipation, to moksha. One may argue that Indian philosophers were religious thinkers, but religious in what sense? Were their religious affiliation obvious in their theories? I think that it is no more obvious than in theoretical constructions of Western philosophers. As a matter of fact, in Indian tradition, the religious affiliation of a philosopher was not necessarily determinative of his philosophical system. For example, it is well known that Shankara was a Shaiva Bhakta. He composed or uh, devotional. Uh, he, he composed a number of devotional hymns. Uh, but in his system of the known dualist Vedanta Advaita, he according to the personal god Sagana Brahman or god with characteristics, only a lower empirical status, while the ultimate reality was for him an absolute consciousness devoid of any forms um, and characteristic, devoid of personality. Even if some philosophers, philosophers somehow make known their beliefs, it may have happened only in a very rational, philosophical way, say, in the form of the proofs of God's existence, like in late Nyaya or Vaisheshika, but that doesn't make them theologians. Many Western philosophers Catholics, and they discussed some theological subjects like Descartes. But isn't that a reason to call him a theologian? Theology in Sanskrit Ishvaravada was one of the subjects dis discussed in uh, Indian philosophical schools. Some of these schools were non theistic, like the Buddhists and even the Mimansakas. The latter, by the way, represented the most ardent theology, uh, apology, sorry, apology of the traditionalist, Brahmanical, and Hindu society based on karma. But even some of those who defended Ishvaravada, like Leit, Nayayakas, Vasheshika, Samkhyas, uh, could not be justifiably called theology, theologians, as this subject was quite marginal for their respective systems. There is one more sense of the word religion which may be applied to Indian philosophical systems. One can say that all Indian philosophers, with the exception perhaps of Charvakas, consider some of their texts as highest religious authority or revelation and a source of uh, uncontestable truth that may be called dogmas. It is the same meaning that we may also attach to the word tradi traditionalist. Even if some Indian philosophical schools were not connected with one particular religion and sometimes openly proclaimed their atheistic stance, they were certainly traditionalistic, as they always based themselves on some authoritative 
text or a set of texts. But traditionalism is not necessarily a religious phenomenon. The Mimatsakas, for example, were traditionalists, but at the same time, they were atheists, quite pragmatic and rationalistic thinkers justifying pragmatic ritualism. And yet, adherence to tradition as a supreme authority does not necessarily lead to a lack of freedom of thought, dogmatism, uh, uh, etc. Why? Uh, for the very reason that from the early times, India knew a multiplicity of religions and theoretical pursuits. There were many different traditions and within them many different interpretations of basic texts of these traditions. Representatives of different schools competed to recruit followers and gain the protection of powerful rules. When they confronted each other in their disputes, they had to resort exclusively to logical arguments and not to their own authorities, uh, to the authorities that their adversaries did not recognize or share. It is difficult to imagine that such a reputed polemist as Shankara could quote from Upanishads, uh, let us say, his Bible. In his controversy with the Buddhists and even some orthodox schools like uh, uh, Vaisheshika, uh, uh, for whom uh, the Vedas were not pramanas or uh, instruments of valid knowledge. In the final analysis, it is this institutional dispute, a public philosophical dispute, that push forward the development of a philosophical thought in India. If our challenge is to determine what is the most specific feature of uh, uh, Indian tradition as compared with the Western religious tradition, uh, I think that it is not theological reasoning, not theology, but it is soteriological orientation Although uh, the latter uh, is being proved by fully rational arguments. Uh, from the Greeks onwards, we are used to think that philosophy is a pure knowledge, theory, a theory, a knowledge uh, as an end in itself. And we forget that even in Greece, after Plato and Aristotle, came the time of practical philosophy, of cynics and stoicians. For them, a philosopher's ideas could not be separated from his way of life. In India, the link between philosophers and their way of life was considered as fundamental. As in India, the truth figures believed that our consciousness uh, is the only means at our disposal to change our perspective in life. Uh, Indian philosophers are convinced that through meditation, our consciousness can be enlarged, deepened, enhanced, and in this way be prepared to meet revelation. The practice, the practice of altered state of consciousness developed through meditation and the ideal of the direct personal experience of ultimate truth in India also helps us to understand why in Indian tradition the relationship between faith and religion was not that close as it was, for instance, in Christianity. Uh, well, uh, yet, when we object that uh, this kind of experience, I mean, mystical experience, has little to do with philosophy. One thing is to follow a religious, uh, theological practice and pass it on to a couple of disciples, parampara we call it in Sanskrit. Another thing is to develop philosophical conceptions. Revelation directly comes through an experience. Yet, when we hear or read the testimonies of those who had this experience, we are dealing not with experience itself, but with these interpretations, which were already somehow processed to feed this or that general worldview. Revelation, in its own way, provides a challenge to reason and decided to build a picture of reality within which this mystical experience would find its proper place and rational justification. And so, 
a reality intuitively discovered from modified state of consciousness becomes the object of different philosophical interpretations. We just cannot get away with a too easy answer, for instance, by labeling these doctrines mystical, meaning that they are product of non-rational methods. Otherwise, why did Indian philosophers submit their ideas to the critical examination of their opponents? They might have merely told their opponents, just practice meditation and you may, by yourself, become convinced that we are right. But, I insist, the problem does not bear on the experience itself, but on its interpretation. Indian masters of truth required philosophical arguments to win disciplines. In this competi competitive milieu, to offer a systematic and logical argument was a critical, crucial matter. In this context, Indian philosophical texts, and they exclusively follow the laws of thought and logic, widely differ from those of Revelation proper. As for the very experience of altered state of consciousness, which is often called mystical and supernatural, Indian thinkers saw in this experience the developments of a natural power of consciousness. I, I will stop here. Thank you.